Hello, my fellow chatterers and book lovers. And anyone else who's popped in because you're curious about what this is, or you've got a bit lost. Welcome, everyone. I am Chatty, and welcome to my channel, Chatty the Mad Chatter, where I'm going to be chatting away madly about section four of my segmented study. Um, so this is the final part of the sort of broken up vlog that I've been reading for Magical Readathon, Spring Equinox. Um, so if you do not know what that is, I have put a link in the description box that tells you all about this Magical Readathon created by G from Book Roast. So you can find all the bits of information you need from there. And at the end of the video, I will also put a playlist of all of my Magical Readathon based videos. So you can have a look through that too, if you are interested. So if you've not been to my channel before, um, I do one shots. I do not do editing because my laptop is incredibly ancient, ancient and can't cope with it. So welcome to chaos. We have cameras falling over. It's all a lot of fun. So cheers everyone. Clink, clink, clink. One shot, no editing. So how has my character Piola Sirloip been doing with his calling of Star Whisperer and all of the other extra classes that he has been taking for the spring equinox? So Piolas has now finished all of the books that he needed to be a Star Whisperer. So we now have Ul inscription and Law completed. So for Law, I had to read a book with a map um, because we were studying the legend of deer and for that I chose Spice Road by Maria Ibrahim which is a YA fantasy and is very very beautiful. It's a desert fantasy, um, it's fully realised magical world with a history, various different countries and of course complete with, as the book says, it's coming a beautiful map which is incredibly detailed and has lots of different places on it which is what I love. So this book includes a quest, we have a lot of travel, we have visiting places and this was a lot of fun to read. So um, I buddy read, sorry I've got another book that I'm just trying to place, there we go. <laughs> I buddy read this with um, Vidania from Vidania Silver Scribe and Chloe from Phantom of the Pages um, because we do sort of fairy loot buddy reads. This is a fairy loot edition. Let me just show you how pretty it is. So we have front cover and then the back cover with these beautiful, um, I don't know if there's a special word for them, but they're, they're those sort of um, Arabian looking windows that are like rectangular and then sort of like arched with a dome. And then you can see the beautiful sort of like sunset -y colours through it of the rocks and mountains. And then we've got this gorgeous sort of like tealy green around the outside. And we have the sprayed edges of green and then stenciling along the spine of a uh, teapot, urn, um, dagger sword and a goblet. And then under the dust jacket, it is just as gorgeous with all of this gold patterning around on foiling on it which is beautiful. We then have end pages here so this is um, our protagonist Imani um, going through some of the um, the desert passes here and I believe this is um, Taha who is also a shield within this world as well so they're both shields together and here we have Imani and um, the character Kain I think I'm pronouncing that properly but if I'm not I do apologize. It also comes with an alternative dust jacket which again is very pretty but I prefer um, I'm not a really fan of people on the cover. Whoa! Nearly knocked over my bookmarks. Um, so we have really lovely artwork as an alternative dust jacket and it says whoever controls the spice controls the kingdom itself. Still in the back on both sides as well. So that's lots of fun. Take the dust jacket off for now. Um, so this was really fun to read along with Daniel and Chloe. It was really fun hearing all of their thoughts as we all got to like different points at different times. So we kind of read it in sections and then all chatted in Discord about our thoughts on those. Um, I think we did it like each 10 chapters or something like that, um, which was great. So in this book, it has, um, it has protagonist who is a shield and um, her brother is believed dead so the family are kind of in mourning um for that um 
this uh, they live in the city of um qualia which is down here and um they all have um magic um so they have um misra they drink misra which is like um a spiced tea um and that kind of imbrues their magical abilities and everyone's gift is different so imani's gift is being able to like control her sword she has this um affinity with this particular um it's sort of it's like a dagger but then she can have it the size of a sword it can turn into a spear she's just got the ability to turn it into into different things um her brother who um who she is mourning was um he was like a shapeshifter he could turn into a beast um and Taha, who's another shield, has um, uh, sort of like a spirit ability with an animal. So he has this bird and they can like share like thoughts and vision. So he can like see what the bird sees and has a, an amount of like control over the bird and can get the bird to do like different things. So there's lots of different kind of abilities in here. And, um, and so they are the gifted, gifted people and um, they are sort of, they're sort of like the chosen they're kind of considering themselves like the, the chosen ones by by the great spirit and it is their duty to kind of protect this magic that they have been gifted and protect this city from all kind of outside threat that's kind of where you are at the start of the book and um, this book deals a lot with um the kind of themes of sort of like where where does kind of your duty lie does it kind of lie with sort of following what you've been told and your loyalty to where you come from and your quest even though it feels hard you know that's the the right decision for you you've got to make that choice because that's what you're there for or do you feel that maybe things have been got wrong and actually you feel you should help and kind of not completely follow what you've been advised to do because you are needed in in ways you could not have foreseen so it's kind of like that flexibility and kind of your compassion and morality so it was exploring what the right thing to do is in those sort of situations and um, it also did look a little bit at, at class I don't I don't feel like we kind of went deep enough into it I felt it was still very much kind of at the fringes of this but this is the first in a trilogy so I'm really hoping that that is explored more in the earlier in the later books because I feel that's something that we we've got unanswered questions like not everything has been pulled out but I felt like a lot of things were very much being hinted at um that um maybe this kind of utopia um that we're given of um Carly is not everything it seems to be maybe there is um what's the word it'll come to me in a moment um so when words are just failing me at the moment <laughs> so there's it's kind of like it's, it's more like social standing it didn't properly go into it but it feels like there's very much like social standing of like families that were renowned to have sort of particular gifts and powers so they kind of have like their family honor and their family traditions and then you get people that have kind of like different gifts and different jobs kind of around this particular city and are kind of seen as lower classes um, and for someone to kind of step outside of their place in that society is deemed unusual. But there's a certain amount of aggression um, and from people who were not expected to get certain positions. So it's kind of this sort of weird um, balance of the people who are seen of lower class are coming across to the protagonist who is of higher class as like angry and aggressive but is there a justification behind that? And for people who believe that the higher classes are, have given been given everything on a plate and are only where they are because of their status rather than their gifts, then like find out that actually no, that they they do have gifts and they do have talent as well. So it's this interesting kind of balance, and I think wasn't fully explored in this. It was just kind of hinted at slightly so I'm going to be intrigued to kind of see where that goes um so I think our protagonist definitely goes on a journey of um having to kind of reevaluate everything she knows like everything she thinks she knows and has been taught to a certain point is kind of not put to the test but she is um 
helped to see that maybe she should question things and I thought that was really fun to explore. We also get to go on a, on a physical quest and a journey and come across um, sort of like magic in different forms and um, different dangers on this journey um, as they leave the kingdom um, on a mission. I think that's all I can say without going into spoilers. <laughs> I hope that was helpful. Um, I really enjoyed the world. I think it was very kind of like really rich sort of like sense of place and atmosphere in here. Like the world felt very real. Um, it felt very fun. There's a different array of characters. Um, I still have a lot of questions about the culture and the land and its rules and its history and how everything's put together so i'm hoping we're going to get more in the next book but it feels like there could be a lot of detail for us to unpick and uncover in terms of the plot and the story there were definitely kind of things that went in different directions from what i was expecting initially there were some that felt um kind of slightly more true to what you would expect from sort of a YA fantasy in that um, you know, it followed kind of that general pattern of that there are going to be certain adventure things and they're going to come out the other side of them if that makes sense um, but it was a really I really enjoyed reading it it was a really kind of fun world and fun adventure and I enjoyed the characters um, if you are someone that really enjoys YA you're going to love this if you're someone that enjoys fantasy but there are certain YA tropes that you don't get on with then um, you might find some of it that you, you kind of want to re read over some of it. I would say that if you enjoyed, I think I'm not as well read in YA fantasy as, as other people, so I'm, I can only go off my small, limited, I don't know what the word is, range of books. Um, so if you have, I'd say if you've enjoyed The Ember and the Ashes, I feel you would enjoy Spice Road. I think it's not quite as harsh a world as Ember in the Ashes um, but you still have character growth in a different way like from where they start to where they finish um, and you still have kind of like layers of history that are being looked at. There is definitely kind of like a, a fast-paced adventure, um, there is a sense of danger, there is a sense of like cruelty within the world um, I'd say Ember in the Ashes is, is harsher and darker because there is um, a certain amount of, of lightness to this and there is a certain amount of fun to this as well. Um, but you do get sort of like um, two potential love interests. You do get sort of like early feelings of um, attraction um, and desire and um, possibility of falling in love in this book as well. So from that, I think you'll get an idea of whether or not it's going to be for you. Um, I'm definitely keen to read on and get the, um, I will be wanting the next books in this trilogy to see where the story goes. Um, I, I have many questions. I have many questions about many things. Um, there were certain things in here that I felt slightly annoyed by because the character makes certain decisions. I'll go on to those in a moment. But all in all, like I did really enjoy the protagonist. I enjoyed the magic. I feel we're going to see more. I, I feel like it's, I feel with this whole book, I feel like we've just scratched the surface and we're going to get a lot more in the next one. So I'm quite excited for that. I think there was what, there was kind of a, a setup for like the main story, like where the character, this is very much like about where the protagonist started and where she finished. Um, and I feel like the next one, we're going to get a lot more from it is kind of how I'm feeling, but we will see. So I'm just going to have a drink of water and I'm going to go into some spoilers. Where is my water? Okay, so spoilers, you've been warned. If you don't want spoilers for this, skip on to the next book where I'm talking about the fifth book. So don't stay if you don't want to get spoiled. Okay, we're going in for spoilers. So um, Imani, the shield, her brother, they've been told has died. The whole family have grieved for him. We then get to chapter four and boom! we see that actually the brother's not dead. Um, the brother did take Misra, which is taboo. You're not supposed to be taking Misra, but we think there's more going on than what there seems to be um, because um, Imani and her younger sister, Amira, 
um, who is a little bit more rebellious, has refused to believe um, that her brother did anything wrong. Um, and uh, it, whereas Imani feels that he's been misled by someone, has probably suffered something terrible and was forced to kind of act in a certain way, they realise that actually they've been told there was no world beyond Qualia and they've just got to protect it from the demons. But actually her brother has found other populations and other people out there, um, although they are not gifted with magic and her brother was helping them and was using the magic to help them because the rest of the kingdom of Akalia has been um, invaded by another country called the Harolands and he was helping people. And the, um, the council line is that um, the people of Kalia are the chosen ones. I've got notes here that I haven't even started looking at um, <laughs> because I'm a moron. What did they call it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so the great spirit wanted the magic to be get secret and protected and that's what the council are doing. And um, they want, um, so Athea is actually not dead. He has gone and left and gone out into um to to be helping sort of with um the other people of Aqua Aquali Aquali what's it called Alkiba Alkiba sorry D ignore me I'm getting all the places wrong Alkiba he's helping all the people of Alkiba so Imani wants to go and bring him home because obviously he's unwell and has been tricked into helping and they need to bring him home to his family where he where he should be. And Amira does Amira and um, Imani meet a djinn called Kain Kain. I'm calling him Kain. Q A Y N. Kain. And they meet a djinn called Kain who says he knows how they can find their brother because their brother confided in him. And um, Imani's nickname is the Jinn, is like the Jinn killer. Like she is renowned for destroying Jinn because they are the enemies. They will try and trick you into doing things that um, are going to be detrimental and you should never trust them. But they take a gamble on the Jinn and the whole story, you're constantly like, do we trust Jinn? Do we not trust Jinn? Um, and Imani is also struggling with the, is her brother in the right? Or is he struggling? Does he need to kind of be brought back? And like, we have to deal with this properly. There's all of that kind of being being questioned. Now, I feel you may know where this is going <laughs> from everything that we kind of feel about the characters. We sort of feel that clearly her brother had been um, disillusioned with the council and their propaganda and wanted to help the common people that didn't have magic in the rest of Alkaba and um, protect them um, from the invasion of the Harrowlands. Um, but you come to this realisation a lot quicker than Amani does. So some of Amani's um, behaviour and um, emotions it doesn't always work because as a reader you've already gone past it. Like we understand why Amani's like that but it would be nice if we could see a little bit, if we could have seen a bit more of like the djinn being menacing and terrifying. Cause you're like, I'm pretty sure if Kayan wanted to do you dirty, he would have done it by now. Um, just kind of trust him up a little, trust him a little bit more because um, your companions also feel very untrustworthy. So you've got to trust somebody. So I feel cause as a reader, you've kind of really jumped to that. It doesn't kind of, it doesn't kind of fit. Like I think what would have, Personally, for me, as the type of reader I am, I would have liked to have believed how Amani believed and then had the revelations at the same time as her. Whereas I feel as a reader, you're kind of one step ahead of the game, really. Um, also, in regards to her younger sister, I feel that her younger sister needs to be listened to a bit more. Like, she's not just rebelling because she wants to rebel. She seems to have got, like, more of an idea of what's going on and be more kind of tuned into her older brother Athir who seemed to have more of an idea of what's going on beyond the towing the party line of the council which is what Imani is doing quite a lot so I think I would have liked a little bit more chat between the sisters and kind of like some things kind of pulled apart and unpicked um but you know Imani did what she did and that's 
fine. I still like Amani. I still think she's great. Um, but I think it would have worked better for me if Amani had got there a little bit quicker or we were shown evidence of um, Jin being like scary or like um, having more of, of an understanding of the council's line rather than just being told it. I thought we need to kind of be in those situations to feel the way Amani felt. Um, and Amani is of a highborn family and she is put on this quest with the daughter of, um, I think it's called like the Great Zahim of the council. So it's like the leader of the council who is of like lower birth. He's not had a history of being on the council. He's the first one of his line. Um, and they've kind of come from sort of like soldiers and kind of laborers and sort of like he's kind of ascended to this position. And there are some people in the council who don't feel he should be in the position because of his like birth status. Um, whereas there's others who feel he shouldn't be there because he's like quite angry and aggressive. So there's this kind of lower class chip on your shoulder that's felt. But at the same time, there's clearly not an equality going on because you've got lower classes and upper classes. And there is a lot of kind of pointing out by both Taha um, who is the son of the great Sahim, who is now the new scout taking over from um, Imani's brother Athea and they go off. Um, he's, he's been put in charge of this quest, which Imani does not approve of. She wants it to be her going to get her brother back. She doesn't want him because they, do, they don't get on. Like, so you see evidence of Taha and Imani not getting on at all. And this kind of like aggressive bullying behavior from a Taha and his like um, cronies um, against Imani. Um, but Taha feels that Imani, because of her high status, judges him as not being worth that. And Imani has always felt that he's hated her for some unknown reason. And, um, and that has kind of like come out more in bullying. So it's interesting to see like the privileged side and the other side, because, you know, bullying is never OK. Bullying is, is wrong. Bullying's not nice. Uh, we don't like bullies. Um, but you can also see with the inequality because of the different classes, why there is this kind of aggression and, and chip on their shoulder. So that was like an interesting aspect. Um, but I never enjoyed Taha because he just seemed to like not be, he always seemed to be like angry and like hiding something a bit more and just be kind of a little bit ruthless um, and not trustworthy. <laughs> Um, but like there is definitely kind of like a, a swaying of, well, sometimes he's like this, but sometimes he's like this and this kind of weird pendulum. And there's a very interesting relationship with his dad. I don't know if we're going to get more of that um, as to why he is how he is. Um, but there is also like a reason because, you know, they have had to fight to kind of be where people, other people are granted that place because of the position of their birth. And if you are high born, you can more likely get away with things. Whereas if you were lower born, you would have the full law of the punishment. So that is an interesting thing of being reflected. And um, Imani's younger sister, Amira, has got friends of a lower status and she uses her privilege to help her friends because she knows that if she gets caught and in trouble, the punishment is not going to be great on her. So her younger sister is a much more aware of the, the, the inequalities in this supposed utopia, whereas Amani seems to be blind to them and seems to believe that there aren't problems in this world, in this city. So that was all. Um, I did enjoy all of that. I feel that has not been dealt with and that is something that will be dealt with kind of later on in the books. Um, but again, like there were moments that annoyed me, like just kind of emotional moments. I'm like, oh, really? Did we need to did we need to do that? I feel that feels like a bit much, but it is what it is. Um, but I did enjoy all of that. I did enjoy when we started kind of getting into the other lands and kind of seeing the um, the other characters and what it's been like living there um, and kind of learning more about what actually happened to her brother, what all these worlds are like. Um, and I, there was kind of like some nice moments of where the bullying sort of stopped and sort of more respect kind of happened. But there always seemed to be a bit of a barrier because Taha seemed to like flip from like Jackal and Hyde sort of flipping. So, so it could have kind of been, there could have been like a togetherness, 
but it was too he was too busy kind of like separating it into low class and high class and like you're my team and these are not these are not my team um what was another point i was gonna make and i can't remember what I was. oh yeah um and you also hear more about kai and the jinn um so he's sort of like you're not really supposed the jinn is the like the enemy of kalia so like if uh if Taha and Cronies found out that Imani's got a gin, then that's not going to look well. So there's a certain amount of humour from certain situations of, ah, yeah, so that's my gin um, that kind of just came up in the book that did make me chuckle. And I enjoyed Kai and the gin. Um, he is um, quite quirky and humorous and um, when inappropriate, it's not, not kind of, it's too strong a word, but that kind of like, appreciation of awkward situations and more likely to kind of make a joke joke of it rather than be offended by it i kind of enjoyed that that characteristic a lot more and um, but you also learn a little bit more about um kai and the jinn's life and there's lots of kind of mystery and questions around him and how he got to be where he was and kind of the, more of the mythology of of the jinn that i feel hasn't been fully explored yet so i've got lots of questions about that and um, there's a way of kind of looking at the magic that their magic can kind of be so it's almost like they only know a small amount of what their gift is and they can actually expand their gift and kind of do a lot more with it. And you see that with Amani. You see how she has managed to expand her magic. So I'd like to explore more of the magic system as well and find out a bit more about that. But all in all, really enjoyed this. Um, so this was a great book for me. Okay, so the final book um, for the, the class that Piolas has to study to be a Star Whisperer um, was Inscription. And that was studying the glyph uh, flight. I'm going to read a book from the highest shelf. And my highest shelf is my hob shelf. So I got to continue on my journey reading hob. So this is City of Dragons, the third book in the Rainwild Chronicles, which is the fourth series in the Realm of the Eldling series overall. So this book has got a very different pace to Dragon Keeper and Dragon Haven, which were is the first two books in the Rainwild Chronicles series but I feel the the Rainwild Chronicles I feel Dragonhaven and Dragonkeeper are just one book <laughs> it kind of works better as one book but the pace changed like the pace and the focus in this change so it's very much Dragonkeeper you've got three different sort of characters you're sort of following and they pull all together on one journey and then you go off on this journey and so it's all very close, just this group of people, this one setting. Whereas Dragon City, you have got a variety of different settings, a variety of different characters, and there is a lot more kind of like plot action and stakes and questions being answered. Whereas the other two books were a lot more about character development and kind of being in the moment and kind of immersion. So I think because I really enjoyed the immersion of the other two, I felt like uh, uh, the structure of the book didn't quite work I just wanted a lot more I wanted it to <laughs> I wanted it to slow down so I could be there for longer um <laughs> I wanted more of the different keepers so you've been with all the different keepers so it just tends to focus sort of on like our the main keepers that we've kind of followed um rather than like the secondary ones that I was also enjoying alongside um but you do get a lot more of the of the law of the world and you get to revisit characters that we met in live ships which was really exciting and oh my goodness their character arcs have just gone on beautifully it's all believable it's all true but if you think about what you thought of that character at the beginning and what you think of them now it's just quite astounding really enjoy we also get to meet kind of new areas and new characters and there is intrigue and there was kind of like um, politics that I hadn't thought of before. Um, but I wanted to spend more time in all of those pieces. I just wanted more. <laughs> um, there are a lot of people, so there's a lot of... Um, I'm also reading this as a buddy read. It's the um, Hob Along, which is being led by Anitha Garde. And she has live shows on her channel. Um, I will link the City of Dragons live show. Um here so uh, if you want to go check that out do they're a lot of fun um and there is a discord chat in Gregory Le Perch's discord of all of the different books as we as we read them and I had so much fun in the in the live chat um chatting with everyone in there 
um and i know um lucia and bridget this was like their favorite and i know that they much preferred this over dragon haze and dragon keeper whereas and they loved the fast pace and it worked for them and it was brilliant but like for me i'm just like oh no but i i want it to slow down so i can go in deeper and have more <laughs> so it didn't quite kind of the opposite effect on me i'm now going to go into spoilers it will be spoilers for live ship a little bit of spoilers for uh 20 man and uh, spoilers for the first two books in Rainwild Chronicles. So I recommend moving to the end where I wrap up how Piolas was doing with all of his studies. You have been warned. Go in for spoilers. So we are introduced again to Tintaglia. I thought it was fantastic kind of um, bookmarking. Book bookending. It was beautiful bookend. Um, so you hear of um, Tintaglia um, Tintaglia, Tintaglia, Tintaglia. Um, at the end of Dragon Haven. Um, do you hear at the end of Dragon Haven? I'm now just going to double check. No, I had got it totally wrong. Um, <laughs> it's just City of Dragons. <laughs> so, yeah, Tintaglia is not part of the other books. We meet Tintaglia again in City of Dragons. So, this is the Fool's Fate spoiler. Tintaglia, within the 20 Man trilogy, there was a lot of chat about freeing this dragon and Tintaglia and Icefire the dragon have gone off onto the honeymoon and forgotten about all the little baby dragons cocooned and hatching um, and she's just off doing all of that. So we get to see her again in this one and it goes in, goes in really full at the beginning of this one. It's a pretty shock. I was like, oh, okay, that's what's happening here. Right, lovely, great. I mean, go all in. It was it was fabulous. It was great to see Tintaglia again and um, to kind of feel the the non dragon worshipping threat and um, feel like kind of the human involvement um, with with dragons and that it's not always going to be friendly. So that was very interesting. We then go to Chalced. Chalced. We've not been there. We've just heard about them. We've just heard about these horrible misogynistic terrible people that that their trade is slavery so it was really fun to go and meet the emperor the dying disgusting emperor um he was hoping for some sort of miraculous cure and that comes in the form of dragon parts we then go from that disgustingness to suddenly selden so little baby Selden, the youngest um, Vesterit from Live Ships, who we saw again in Tawny Man, who is there in elderling form, you know, asking for support for um, the Bingtown and Rainworld against Chalced. Selden is captured. We're like, how did this happen? So there's all of these surprises going on in the book, which I love, but we only get small bits of Selden and I would have loved to have heard more about Selden's capture, Selden's treatment and kind of just been with him because I feel the emotion of that would have hit me harder if I had sort of been with him more on that um, because I just think of all the emotion we had with um, Wintro in Ship of Magic and all the emotion we've kind of had um, with like following Fitz's journey and being with him at certain points. So although yes, Selden is like a secondary character, that's a big thing that's happened to him. And obviously we've, we've heard of him before. So I, I felt like we, we could have had a bit more following of Selden. I would have, been I would have liked that. Um, I, I really enjoyed um, there's some beautiful moments between um, Cedric and um begins with c carson carson we love carson some lovely moments um with cedric and carson here and their relationship and i just find it so wonderful for us to have seen like uh, an abusive relationship an abusive um homosexual relationship and then a healthy homosexual relationship and i thought that was i think hobbs done it brilliantly and um, it's so nice to see 
very different characters. Cedric and Carson have come from very different places. And just the love between them and just the communication. I love healthy communication. And there was just this beautiful moment where Carson, who is practical, physical, labouring, and Cedric is much more kind of planning and likes nice things and Carson wants him to, you know, Cedric will complain about stuff but he's complaining just because he's complaining but Carson is trying to fix it so Cedric feels happy because he knows that Cedric is living a very different life to what he was living before so it was really lovely for Carson to like be sort of stressing himself out trying to make little windows so that Cedric could have windows and light and Cedric suddenly realised like how much effort so it comes back to this kind of whole concept of like the languages of love and to Carson one of the languages of love is being able to fix things for the person you love and Cedric was just like oh my goodness just like you've just been doing so much for me and you don't need to I'm just moaning <laughs> I'm sorry I was moaning um, but I am happy here and I would choose this and you every time but I think there was still kind of a lot of like Cedric still trying to work out he needs to I think he feels like he's not able to show his skill set and his normal skill set and feels a bit annoyed with himself for coming across as weak. That's always been something that he has struggled with in his life. Um, so he's kind of got his own kind of like self-worth issues kind of creeping in a little bit. But they spoke about it and it was so lovely to see them speaking about it. And it was just it was beautiful. I love their relationship. Um, we also got to see if keeps the following um, Elise and Leftrin's relationship and you know where Elise's life is possibly going to go now where Leftrin's life is, is possibly going to be going and sort of looking into that and also the practicalities of them all being in Kelsingra and it was just wonderful and one of the things I really appreciated was being able to see Elise's strength through Leftrin. One of my favourite parts of the book was the political um, side where Lefterin goes back to it's a place that begins with sea, it's not tree cog, it's part of the rain wilds and there's a lot of political unrest in there because you've got different factions, you've got rain wild people, you've got tattooed people who were slaves previously who have been invited to come and live in the rain wilds and be part of this community but clearly there hasn't been a lot of managing the integration between people and saying to the tattooed look, we appreciate that you've come here, but there are certain parts of our culture you need to respect and understand. Please don't stare at us. Yes, we've got like growths and we look different in appearance to you because of us living here, but this is our home. Don't make us feel like that. And equally, the Rain Wild needs people to say, Tattoo, this is your home now. Like we are, you are now Rain Wild. We are, we are in allowing, allowing welcoming you and integrating in you this is yours too so there needed to be more effort put into that we find out now because we hadn't heard of this apart from Bingtown we'd only heard of the wonderful planning stage so it was interesting to see the fallout so again I would have loved to have stayed there for a bit longer to have seen all of that to have maybe had um more time with so here we go here are the people that we meet again from uh live ships we see Rain and Malta again and they are much more central in this story. We get to meet one of Rain's um, sisters, younger sisters, Tilma, Til Tilamon. I would have loved to kind of have been again introduced to Tilamon as more of a central character so we could have heard about what life's been like for her and um, how she has felt as someone who is Rain Wild who is um, much more um, has a lot more kind of like rain wild physical um physical traits so she looks a lot more unusual and sort of disfigured because of all of this um i would have enjoyed that i would have also enjoyed following a tattooed person to see from their point of view what life's like for them i would have found that really interesting but anyway leftrin goes to the council and is like we want our money like you need to come good on everything that you promised us and then i will tell you what we have discovered and what's wonderful is hearing like how Elise as Bingtown Trader grilled him and coached him and um, had all of the legalities sorted for him. So he went in prepared because he has been mentored and trained by Elise. And I thought that was wonderful to see that. Um, 
and yeah I really loved that scene it was it was so much fun then one of the hardest scenes to read about in this book and I did have to just I had to skip some pages so I had to leave certain storylines to follow this one particular storyline that I could not go to sleep until I had found out the outcome for this and that is Malta giving birth to her baby um when she's been taken hostage and maybe killed alongside her child and eaten and sold to the um emperor of Chao said so that he can get his miracle cure by eating dragon people just how how the scene oh my goodness just so emotional and gripping and I'm really looking forward to reading all of the Realm of the Eldlings again so I can properly like just appreciate it all because I was just reading really fast and just needing Malta to be safe and needing the baby to be safe and just it was it was a lot it was a lot we then get to see Tarman again and just we then go on a different place with all of that so there's a lot of it there's a lot that happens in here it's very intense there's a lot of stuff going on um and I really enjoyed it all but then we get this massive other bombshell at the end about the emperor of Chalced's daughter who has been trying to stage a women's rebellion and I'm just like again I would have loved to have a character in Chalced that we were following like it it was an enjoyable conversation like hearing these things unfold and it was kind of more like scene setting and planning but I'm just like if Hob had kind of had more time with this book to give it the full Hob effect where we're all immersed in all of these things, it would have just been amazing. I would have loved if we'd have been given um, the daughter of the Duke as one of our viewpoints, along with Selden in that throughout this story. So we could have just like been there for all these beats. I, I think I would have been in pieces on the floor with all of that. But that's how I like to read Hob um one of the things that i sort of like found a bit more difficult so we'll see how it goes as the next one goes on so i really enjoyed the character of the mara in dragon haven and i really enjoyed the exploration of um uh sort of feminism and choice of your own body and um consent and pressure and relationships i enjoyed everything that was explored in Dragonhaven through that. Um, it was still explored in City of Dragons, um, but I think for <laughs> me to enjoy those characters more is also to have storyline from them where it's not just about sex. <laughs> um, because I think I felt because that is the main focus I felt like the theme just got lost ever so slightly because it all focused on that and I think it can easily be dismissed as teenage hormones rather than actually what are the social implications because there was some amazing stuff again from Carson about like sex politics so those characters are being used to kind of explore the theme of like of sex politics and I think that's brilliant, but I want, I think, to feel the characters are more rounded other than by, you know, their libidos. I think I wanted more of them exploring being elderlings as well, beyond sexual appetites and pairings. Um, so which is why I wanted more of the other keepers to kind of balance it out. I wanted more of the relationship between the other dragons and the dragons and just exploring kind of their their bodies just to kind of like and their changes and how they feel physical physically inside and I think I just need wanted a bit more of that beyond and I think again if this was allowed to have been a bigger book then that would have been possible because it just felt at certain moments I was like can we just can we just get over this a little bit like just please just give the girl some space or just have a different type of focus <laughs> um but I enjoyed the theme of the sex politics, but it was just awkward within that. Cows and Grow is so much fun. I'm really enjoying all the elderling stuff in that and I can't wait for more. So I'm really excited to read Blood of Dragons. But I do feel like we've got a lot to tie up. We've got the Malta, the sick baby, the potentially being hunted storyline. 
we've got the politics of Rain Worlds and Tattoos and Bing Town storyline. We've got Pigeon People storyline. We've got, um, I haven't even spoken about Hest. Hest comes back and is, it's quite enjoyable to hear about how difficult his life is. <laughs> <laughs> scary times um so yeah there's that hest plot line to explore as well you've got the more exploration of calcine you've got more wanting dragons to fly we've got seldom possibly being eaten we've got this potential uprising in Chalced that is being blocked there's, there's tintaglia who um is injured and is hopefully coming back so that's a lot and um how many pages is dragon blood of dragon i don't think it's that big hold on yeah so the next book blood of dragons is 531 pages but usually hobbs books are like 800 so i just feel it's a lot of work for that book to do to wrap everything up satisfactorily and give me the emotional parts that i need so i'm a little bit apprehensive but it's Hob, I will trust, I will trust Hob, I will trust in Hob and it'll be fine. Anyway, that is the end of all of my studies. So let's see how Piola's did. Here we go. These are all of Piola's classes for um, Star Whisperer. We have left my notes over here. <laughs> Come back. I'm still filming. Excellent. Great. Didn't pause. <laughs> Where's my brain? Where's my brain? Astronomy. Okay, cool. We have astronomy. We have psionics and divination. Um, we have, um, ah, what was that one? Say I know nothing. What was it? Art of illusion. Okay, cool. Right. Let's, let's try this again. I absolutely should have paused. Astronomy, psionics and divination, art of illusion, law, and inscription. There we go. Piola's read all of those and now is officially able to carry on their studies of a Star Whisperer. But Piola's is a SWAT and also wants to read everything on the list. So uh, my April wrap up will be coming out where I will wrap up everything that Piola's studied. So you will see exactly what Piola's got up to. Thank you so much for watching. Please let me know um, what you read for the Magical Readathon, if you took part, or any thoughts you have on these books I have spoken about. Happy reading, everybody!